Hey everybody, Rob Maurer here, and today we are going to be talking a little bit about batteries. We've got some rumors on 4680 battery production, some news on batteries at Fremont. We've also got news on Tesla pushing back on dealership regulation, some news on FSD beta, a couple other items as well. Quick look at the stock, not a whole lot to say on it today. The Nasdaq continuing to fall 1.1%. Tesla underperforming today, down 2.5% to close at $277.70. So kind of all of a sudden here, over the last two weeks, the NASDAQ has dropped 10%. Tesla, even with the underperformance today, bearing about the same. All right, we're going to start off here with a rumor on 4680 battery production. This came out late last week from a YouTube channel by the name of CleanerWatt. Normally, I don't dabble too much in YouTube type of rumors, but this one did seem relatively credible and I think worth discussing. I think CleanerWatt did a nice job presenting this information, which appears to come from a source within Tesla. And I think the level of detail that is discussed here adds a lot to the credibility. So of course, I'll link this in the description. I would recommend the whole video. It's only about 10 minutes. And as I said, well presented, but we will cover the gist of it here, which is a couple of items. So first off, CleanerWatt is saying that Tesla is working on a new 4680 production process, which combines what are currently three machines into one. Those three machines right now are being used for notching. So making laser cuts into the copper foil, which is eventually wound by a second machine with the separator, and then a third machine, which welds the current collector to the top and the bottom of the jelly roll. So how big of a deal is integrating all of these into one machine? I think very tough for us to say externally. I mean, you could integrate things and get no improvement from doing that. Or on the other end of the spectrum, you could have something like a casting machine, which completely eliminates parts and processes that old machines would have had. In this case, I don't see any way that any of these steps would be eliminated. Not an expert on that by any means, but it seems pretty clear that each of these steps would need to happen versus something like casting, where it's much more apparent why that would eliminate some steps. So I think you could present that as a spectrum somewhere between iterative and revolutionary. This to me would seem to fall closer to the iterative side, and that's not at all meant in a diminishing way. Iterations are fantastic. That's one of the things Tesla does best. It's just to try to help us understand and contextualize what we're even talking about here. That said, any improvements that Tesla is making here in terms of simplifying the production process, which hopefully going down from three to one machine would do, should hopefully yield improvements in cost of production from fewer machines, and then hopefully also improve production rates, which in and of itself tends to lower unit costs. So then you've got compounding cost efficiencies. Presumably that would be what Tesla is iterating towards here. So CleanerWatt says that right now Tesla is using this production process with about 5% of the 4680 cells being produced at the Cato Road facility, and that they're hoping to use this new machine for 4680 production at Texas and possibly Berlin as well. CleanerWatt also says that Tesla's working on a second generation of the 4680 cell itself, which looks like some of the differences can even be seen in some of Tesla's promotional footage. Again here, we're limited in terms of the exact information, what this might mean for the specs of the cell or whatever else, but it serves as an important example in both cases here for the production process for the cell itself of Tesla's constant iteration. I mean, hopefully soon we hear a little bit more from Sandy Monroe about the details of the 4680 cells that they have from that production vehicle, but even when we get that, this is showing us that that information by the time we get it is likely to be out of date. All right, staying on batteries for a moment, we've got an interesting report today from Tesla Roddy. They have noticed a filing from Tesla in Fremont for a building permit, which Tesla describes under the project information by saying, quote, new battery manufacturing equipment line on second floor of main assembly building. This permit application relates to the module portion of the line, end quote. So it's a little bit vague. Tesla Roddy does say that according to the documents that they looked at, the project is valued at one and a half million dollars. And there is another application for a one point three million dollar project that quote, includes the installation of a new maintenance office, a storage area, production cells with equipment for hood, fender, and trunk lids, and offline cell manufacturing equipment, end quote. So based on the costs accompanying these filings, it wouldn't seem to be anything to do with cell production necessarily. It mentions offline cell manufacturing equipment. The other one says that it's a new battery manufacturing equipment line. So maybe this is a production line for battery production equipment, but it also says that this permit application relates to the module portion of the line. So maybe Tesla is using this to assemble cells into modules. And maybe a reason for that would be what we had talked about yesterday, the advanced manufacturing production credit, which could mean $10 per kilowatt hour for battery modules assembled in the United States. We know Tesla for the Model S and X is using 18650 cells from Japan, but I'm not sure when and where those cells are made into modules. So maybe this is related to that, but I would kind of be surprised if Tesla wasn't doing that themselves already at Fremont. So tough to say with such little information, but if you've got a better idea, definitely let me know in the comments today. Speaking of the advanced manufacturing production credit, I've had a little bit more time to think about this, read some comments and feedback, and I do think it's probably the case that under most circumstances, Tesla should be able to get the credits here. 
I'm hopeful that this is just a case of confusing wording, especially that special rules section where it says that an eligible component can be integrated into another eligible component, which is then sold, and that's fine, which to me implies that if it's integrated into something else, then it is not. Otherwise, what purpose does this special rule serve? It would not seem to serve any, because if you remove that, that's how the legislation would read anyway, at least to me. So I'm hoping that's a case of overclarification actually ending up making things more confusing. I don't have certainty in either direction, like I said yesterday, but I am leaning more in that direction. By the way, on that point, I see a lot of people that just go on Twitter and say, Rob said this, Rob said that, about topics that I clearly expressed uncertainty on. Please don't do that. I like to think that I've got pretty good credibility. That credibility is important to me. So if you go out and you say that I said something without including that I also said that I'm uncertain about it, that can be very misleading to people. It can also hurt my credibility. So unless you want me putting a disclaimer around everything like three or four times that, hey, I'm not sure about this, please make sure to include that context. So I lean more today towards Tesla being eligible for that credit. Again, not 100% on that either. But in either case, it is still an important exclusion to understand because there will probably still be cases where Tesla gets hit by that exclusion. I'm thinking things like the robo-taxi. If Tesla's building their own batteries for that, putting them in the robo-taxi, not selling that to anybody, well, no credit. Same situation for any Tesla semis that Tesla wants to put into their own fleet. If those battery packs for the semis are around 950 kilowatt hours or so, that's $43,000 in credits Tesla would be foregoing versus selling that semi to another company. That's a pretty big difference that could affect Tesla's decision-making process in terms of what they do with their semi-production. And then this would also be huge for Megapacks because if Tesla is, again, keeping Megapacks themselves, which I think would have been a very lucrative business, they don't have the possibility of generating those credits if they were to sell the Megapack to somebody else. So this creates some pretty strong incentives for Tesla to not keep their own production. For the case of robo-taxis, well, I don't really care as much about that. If Tesla solves robo-taxis, as big as these credits are, they pretty quickly become insignificant. All right, moving on from batteries, we've got an update from the Wall Street Journal, which is reporting that Tesla has filed a lawsuit in Louisiana to challenge regulations in the state that restrict Tesla from selling vehicles directly to customers. This is, of course, an issue in a number of states, so Tesla must feel they have a particularly strong or viable case in Louisiana. Tesla is arguing that the laws interfere on interstate commerce, among other things, and has named the Louisiana Automobile Dealers Association and multiple officials at Louisiana's Motor Vehicle Commission, which Tesla says conspired to bring the current laws and regulations into place. So this will be an interesting one to follow. Tesla has done this before in Michigan. They ended up settling, getting some, albeit limited rights, to sell in the state. All right, next we've got an update on FSD Beta 10.69.1. It does appear that it has started to roll out. Looks like right now just going to the testers that had FSD Beta 10.69. Not sure there's been any additional expansion yet. I don't think there's anything new in the release notes for 10.69.1 versus 10.69, but it does look like, based on information that Holmars is sharing here, that Tesla is resetting the strike counter with this version like Elon had previously alluded to on Twitter. So if you have been previously locked out of FSD beta from strikes, looks like this might get you back in, but we'll have to wait to find out for sure. Next, we've got a new study released by JD Power seeking to understand customer perception of innovation across automotive brands. Technically, Genesis ranked at the top with a score of 643 out of 1,000 points, but only because Tesla, as is usually the case for JD Power studies, is not technically eligible by their own criteria which excludes Tesla because Tesla doesn't give them customer information and states that they are not legally required to. Something every other brand on this list, by the way, apparently has no problem doing. So as usual, Tesla not eligible, JD Power still has no problem giving them a score, which in this case is 681 and would easily top the ranking and sits about 40% above the industry average. No surprises there, probably the only surprise would be that it's not even further ahead. Looks like Mazda, Honda, and Chrysler are sitting at the bottom. All right, we do have a little bit more news on Twitter today. Elon Musk has filed an updated 13D with Twitter. In this filing, he is unsurprisingly providing even more reasons to terminate this merger agreement. In essence, he is taking everything that he can from the Peter Zatko whistleblower case and adding those to his reasons from before, which completely makes sense. He talks about how Twitter is in material non-compliance due to alleged FTC violations in that Peter Zatko case, vulnerability to systemic disruption due to for security measures, misappropriation and infringement on intellectual property, etc., etc. Basically just a rundown of Zatko's whistleblower case. Musk's side right quote, The facts support these breaches, which were withheld from the Musk parties but known to Twitter as of the date of the merger agreement and at the time of the July 8th termination notice. 
provided additional bases to terminate the merger agreement as of that date, and provide additional bases to terminate the merger agreement today if the Musk Party's termination of the merger agreement pursuant to the July 8th termination notice is determined to be invalid for any reason. This also provides a basis for rescission, end quote. So basically, Elon's side saying, hey, even if none of those reasons were good enough before, well, all these reasons are good enough now. Given all of these new details, Elon Musk has also asked the court permission to delay the Twitter trial by about a month, according to a Reuters report today. So definitely strengthening Elon's case, but we'll see what the court has to say about that. All right, last couple of things here. Yesterday, Lucid filed with the SEC to allow them permission to raise up to an aggregate of $8 billion in capital through one or more equity offerings over the next three years. So that doesn't mean that Lucid has raised that capital yet, but it is something that it seems like they are considering doing and putting this in place so that if they want to, they can do that relatively quickly. That would potentially add a lot of cash, a lot of runway for Lucid, but also means the possibility of pretty extreme dilution, which should have been expected based on Lucid's current financials. Last item for today then, Starlink continues to make really exciting headlines, this time with Royal Caribbean Cruises, which has announced that Starlink is going to be installed on all Royal Caribbean International, Celebrity Cruises, and Silver Sea cruise ships, and all new vessels for each of these brands. They say that this is beginning immediately, and that installation is slated to be completed by the end of the first quarter of 2023, so basically within the next six months. This is extremely exciting to see. Starlink is going to dominate in the ocean. It's going to dominate in the air in addition to rural areas. There just really isn't any competition, and it's fun to see Starlink getting to the point where they can start to offer these services. So congratulations to SpaceX for what I'm sure is a strong contract for them. And that is where we'll leave it for today. So as always, thank you for listening. Make sure you're subscribed and signed up for notifications. You can also find me on Twitter at Tesla Podcast. And we'll see you tomorrow to wrap up August for the Wednesday, August 31st episode of Tesla Daily. Thank you.